thank you very much for jo joining us this morning. Um, my name is Alex Barnes. Um, I'm, I'm head of, head of insurance at BDO. Um, I think we've got a very, very interesting talk for you this morning, um, um, which is really sort of aimed to um, pick up some key matters that have been affecting um, the, the, um, the, the um, that have been affecting the insurance market, 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 market in these um, strange, strange times. Um, so, so we've got some Charles Portsmouth, who's going to cover key regulatory developments. Um, we've got Richard Cameron, Cameron Williams, who's going to cover um, the business interruption claims go, 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 going on. And um, Santiago Restrepo in London, who's going to cover claims and actuarial. And last but not least, um, Tom, Thomas, Thomas Toe, to think about the tax risk opportunities that are, are sort of there, out there right now. Um, a few points of admin before we get 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 I'm going. Um, um, first of all, um, this session will be recorded. Um, and the slides will be available later. Um, so those will be sent around to you later. Uh, next one is really lines all muted. Um, but we'd like questions as well. So um, there's a Q and A function at the bottom of Zoom. If you if you click on that um, and uh, and uh, and um, and um, and um, just ask questions to the panelists through through um, that that'd be fantastic, um, and also use that as well to ask us any questions as well. Um, so at BDO, we've been thinking about um, COVID um, team across lots of sectors, um, and we've been applying a rethink model which has really looked at, firstly, how businesses have reacted to COVID-19 um, to make sure that they are protected. Um, then resilience. So during the lockdown phase, which we're still um, 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 sort of really in, um, how they're making sure that they're resilient. And then in the future, helping businesses realize their potential going forward and also seeing where businesses are realizing their potential going forward. Um, if we reflect this on the insurance market, during the first few months or first few weeks even, the react phase was quite amazing. We saw the insurance market very, very quickly reacting to working from, from, um, from, um, from um, home. Um, yes, investments got a, 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 a big, big hit, but actually the insurance companies generally were able to continue uh, without operations too badly affected and with no major claims impact initially. Um, resilience phase, we've, we've um, seen claims actually in many areas of insurance being very, very positive. Um, of course, some areas have been impacted by the COVID-19 claims, but still there's uncertainty as to how some lines of business will be affected going forward. And then if we're looking um, much more at the, the um, um, so, um, uh, um, a, it's a lot more the, the um, um, sort of um, realised side, it's going to be interesting to see how the market develops going forward. COVID-19 has sort of proved that the market can work remotely. Um, to what extent is it going to change the way the market operates going forward? And the Lloyd's blue, blue, um, blue um, print. Um, also, there's some great opportunities just from the underlying pricing of insurance. Um, insurance market needs claims um, and claims have arrived, which means that the pricing is, rea is reacting, which will lead to business opportunities as well. Right, um, um, I'll, I'll just pass you on to Charles to talk through the um, regulatory developments. Thanks, Alex, um, and a good morning to everybody. Um, it's a pretty murky day up here in North London, but I hope you have something different wherever you might be. As Alex said, I've been tasked with talking about the regulatory outlook and any issues that arise from COVID-19. And I've titled my slides with Plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose which when translated, I've taken to mean, the more things change, the more they stay the same, because this is roughly the approach our regulators have taken, as we shall see. So let's step back in time to look at both regulators' business plans, which were published at or around the same time that the current hiatus began. The PRA's central themes were prudential standards, i.e. focusing on new firms, new risks, and business model changes. Emerging risks, climate change, artificial intelligence, and fintech. Financial resilience in terms of asset quality, solvency, liquidity, stress testing, 
to assess and assure themselves on policyholder protection. And operational resilience, which is defined as the ability of firms to prevent, adapt, respond to, recover, and learn from operational disruptions. Recovery and resolution planning. And lastly, the post-Brexit issues, including a regulatory framework review and possible changes to elements of solvency too. Meanwhile, the FCA were planning to continue to concentrate on four main themes, products and services being suitable for customer needs, customers not being unfairly excluded by digitalization or vulnerability, products being of a high quality and offering fair value and delivering what is intended at the time of a claim. And lastly, of course, operational resilience. This was jointly with the PRA, as I mentioned. The operational resilience piece has been tested in spades over the past few months. And as Megan Butler, an FCA executive director said recently, I think it's fair to say that in operational terms, this industry has responded well. However, she went on to note that for the FCA, operational resilience includes both financial resilience and continuing to act with integrity. Conduct, unsurprisingly, remains their central focus, as highlighted by the business interruption case, to be discussed in more detail by Richard later this morning. Both regulators' initial response to COVID-19 was to allow latitude for some of the deadlines for existing mainly reporting deadlines, and to responding to new regulatory requirements as firms got used to the new operating environment. But they're now expecting business as usual in the main. Next slide. And the more recent updates, policy updates from the regulators reinforces that they are now back on course to meet their business plan objectives. They are back to normal. The PRA are continuing to develop policy in areas including reviewing solvency two, and also the risk-free rate calculations post Brexit. And they're also looking at the effectiveness of the senior management certification regime, where reforms may be made. And of course, operational resilience continues to be a significant part of their ongoing agenda. Consultation papers were released on this and outsourcing late in 2019, and policy statements will be released probably in the new year. Like the FCA, the PRA saw the finance sector's response to COVID-19 as a relatively good news story. The sector's operational resilience has been tested, but they do not see this as the full story. COVID-19 is seen as having part, uh, partly evolved slowly, giving everybody preparation time, it being prolonged, giving further time to adapt business models and symmetric in that it affected all firms and all sectors of the UK economic and social activity both equally and at the same time. It wasn't a sudden shock as those caused by an IT failure or a cyber attack at a single firm and therefore they believe there is more work to be done on operational uh, resilience in this area in particular. So areas for the rethink being identified by firms and the PRA include business continuity over a prolonged period and traditional disaster recovery processes, processes. Are these going to change going forward? Ensuring first line service resilience may have been at the expense of re relaxing internal controls on say recording of trading or data protection protocols. The second and third lines of defence are having to rethink their roles in terms of access to data and or changed operational procedures. So are these lines of defence still effective given their remote operation and the potential inability to have as much focus on control effectiveness as hitherto? The PRA is expecting boards and senior management to know what aspects of their firm's businesses have the most impact on financial stability their own business success and their customers' needs. What is critical for the firm to continue to function, its financial stability, and what a firm needs to protect some of what it's, it does all of the time, i.e. the firm can continue to deliver its important business services. Turning back to the FCA, 
they've recently published their consultation paper on general insurance value measures reporting. They've also set out their stall in terms of extending this reporting for many more products than are currently covered. They're pushing ahead with their consumer vulnerability agenda, with further guidance due early in the new year, and they're contributing to the Treasury-driven regulatory framework review. In their September Dear CEO letter to the general insurance sector, they identified financial resilience and product issues to be key areas of concern from their point of view. The product issues are a cause for rethink in our new business world. The key questions include, how are our product governance arrangements being carried on and do they need to change? Do we need to reevaluate some of the products to ensure they meet the enforced changes in our customers' behaviors arising from their current circumstances? Are our incentive arrangements correct in the new circumstances and should they be modified? How do we ensure that sales discussions are monitored to ensure that there are no issues around the integrity of those conversations? And where and what are the links in our business change that we need to monitor and how are we continue to do so and also to evidence we're doing so? This is particularly important where firms have responsibility for the compliance of that link in the change. So appointed representatives are the prime example of this potential issue. In terms of operational resilience, they recognize that some firms have struggled due to a lack of critical mass, limited access to capital, or a business model that has been, been unable to absorb the significant shock to the UK's economy. As a result, there is a risk that a number of firms in the FCA's supervisory portfolio might fail. Thus, they have stressed the importance of their guidance for firms in financial difficulty and the need for appropriate management of a firm's financial resources and for forecasting ahead. This means boards adapting or rethinking business strategy to meet the change conditions or the new normal, a term that we're all becoming used to. Rethinking budgets and reacting to the actual performance to date. Stress testing those revised plans and budgets. Maintaining regular cash flow forecasts, including modeling solvency capital requirements that reflect the changed circumstances of the business. Planning for an orderly exit, where and if necessary. Continuing to meet the FCA's regulatory requirements. And lastly, of course, keeping the FCA informed of any potential issues. And of course, we and they are having to face and possibly rethink about the upcoming challenge of Brexit. This is an issue that before COVID-19 would be getting much more airtime, I suspect. And whilst we know that the search for a negotiated deal, which establishes our future relationship with the EU continues, we're uncertain as to what it may contain and what it might mean for the insurance sector and financial services more generally. And I thought, therefore, it was worth reminding you all of what no deal, as of 31st of December 2020, means for insurers, and in case the current hiatus causes a need to rethink your current planning. Solvency 2 and the Insurance Distribution Directive govern, govern the current relationship and set out the definition of insurance activity and the related authorization requirements for both insurers and distributors of insurance products. Whilst the ID has no equivalence provisions, the Solvency II Directive does contain limited equivalence provisions. Equivalence can be granted in three areas. Firstly, for reinsurers from third countries, which the UK will become, if the particular third country's rules are deemed equivalent, then reinsurers must be treated by EEA supervisors in the same way as EEA reinsurers. Secondly, equivalence for insurers operating in third countries, allowing them to use local rules rather than the solvency to rules for capital requirements. And thirdly, on group supervision for third country insurers operating in the EEA, where if deemed equivalent in this area, EEA supervisors will, under certain conditions, rely on group supervision exercised by a third country, thus no dual group supervision. UK equivalence is still being assessed by the EU and there may no, be 
and there may no, be no salvation from this particular route at the end of the day. So currently, the EU's, UK's EU withdrawal means no passport rights under the existing freedom of services or freedom of establishment regulations. European branches will become branches of third party undertakings and will require to be authorised in the member state where the branch is located. However, the authorization does not give rise to passporting rights to the rest of the EU, as the branch is only authorised to carry out insurance activity within the member state in which it is authorised. EU subsidiaries of UK insurance undertakings will be authorised and have passporting rights throughout the EU, but as I previously noted, without equivalence, will be subject to dual regulation and UK reinsurance act undertakings will be subject to the regulations on reinsurance activity in each member state. These might differ between those member states. This means that without equivalence, those, firms can be less, those terms can be less favourable than those granted to EU undertakings. In relation to servicing of contracts and current policyholders, mitigation measures should have been put in place and the policyholders kept informed. And lastly, and I guess that some, to some extent this has been removed by the current situation, staff travelling to Europe on business need to take care they're not conducting regulated activities without having their regulatory permissions. And this probably also applies to conducting business over Zoom. How is the compliance officer going to monitor that? A potential rethink might be needed here. The PRA and FCA are continuing to prepare using the transitional provisions regime and have recently announced further rule changes to that. Thanks for your attention and please submit any questions you might have, which we will attempt to answer later. I now am going to hand over to Richard, who's going to explore the current FCA business interruption case in a little bit more detail. Thanks, Charles. Um, yes, just going to uh, little give up an update in relation to the FCA business interruption test case. Um, it's going to be a bit of a synopsis uh, over the next sort of 10 minutes or so. Um, and, you know, it is quite a sort of complex subject that could probably uh, run to a much greater sort of length. So the, the, the test case was initiated to try and give some level of certainty to policyholders around potential cover um, from COVID-19. Um, it doesn't look at uh, COVID-19 as a trigger to a property damage policy, but looks at the non-damage uh, extensions and uh, whether or not they might give rise to cover. Um, so eight insurers were signed up for test case, uh, a total of 21 policies were considered. Um, the hearing was held uh, towards the end of July and uh, the judgment was recently handed down on the 15th of September. There's been lots of uh, discussion around the judgment um, and we'll go on a little bit later in relation to some of the clarifications that, that started to come through last week. Uh, but I think from a sort of practical perspective, um, there is significant complexity uh, yeah, in the judgment, especially due to the, the, the myriad number of potential policy wordings and, and how exactly things pan out on a case by case basis um, is, is still really to be sort of established. So the key findings have put us sort of into three categories of policy extension. Um, the disease wordings, where the main trigger was the disease itself, um, were generally held to have pretty wide uh, cover. Um, so once the, the disease became sort of notifiable, that would, that would trigger. Um, where there were radius requirements, um, it was held that so long as there was a case within that radius, that was enough to trigger the policy there would be no causal link back to that and in fact you know the but for scenario for those cases would be um, a no covid situation so potentially giving rise to, to quite a large recovery of the economic damage from covid for those particular wordings the prevention of access sort of public authorities wording um, i think the, the the judgment was much more favorable in, in relation to you know to insurers um, the wordings will have to be a lot a lot narrower um, the challenge of, of sort of generalizations uh, on, on this sort of 
particular extension is, is challenging just because of the sheer number of wordings that, that were looked at even amongst the policies in the test case. So prevention of access could have that been prevention or could be denial or hindrance. It could have been access to premises due to actions, uh, advice, restrictions imposed by uh, government, local authority, police, and it uh, could be due to an emergency likely to endanger life, it could be due to an incident. Now all of those individual wordings uh, were, were deemed to have you know, different impacts in relation to how the, 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 uh, the extension might trigger. Um, ones with a, a sort of narrow radius and talking about an incident and requiring prevention of access was deemed very, very narrow, if not, not giving any cover or not giving any cover in relation to a, a national pandemic. Um, whereas I think where it's maybe sort of hindrance of access and based on advice, then potentially the, 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 the cover could be, could be wider. So I think there's a number of sort of complex aspects of that to really ascertain you know, what any individual policy uh, or how it would trigger. The hybrid wordings um, mainly focused on, on Hiscox. Um, I sort of bit, bit of a win for both sides, really. Uh, it was held that um, the wordings of sort of restrictions imposed and inability to use required a mandated closure. So the, the sort of advice um, was, was not sort of held to be sufficient and it required um, the sort of shutdowns that mainly sort of occurred on the 26th of March um, to, to, to trigger the policies. And of course, uh, unless there was a mandated closure, there's a question mark over, over cover. Um, we'll come into it a little bit later because one of the areas of clarification is around how that works for, for businesses such as Category 5 offices, where you know, most people were told to sort of stay away, um, but there was not necessarily a, a mandated closure um, of the office. But where this clause does trigger, again, um, the, the scenario would be that the, the premises was not then. Uh, lockdown and, and COVID-19 um, was, not, was not prevalent. So you know, the overarching piece, which was you know, quite a sort of major change from uh, his, you know, recent case law, was really in relation to, to the but-for trends um, and causation, uh, and really sort of overturned the Orient Express uh, case, which sort of said that, yeah, Obviously, this was in relation to a sort of hurricane that caused damage to a hotel. And it was held that the but four was just but for the damage, uh, and the hurricane still needs to be factored into, into the trend. This sort of departs from that by taking in the composite clauses, both say the shutdown and the disease out of it. So again, potentially providing much wider coverage where, where cover has been triggered um, and allowing policyholders to recover. Uh, far more of the economic impact of COVID. Just move on. So the test case really was you know, really impressive. Um, I mean, the scope, but also the speed of this. I mean, you know, the amount of work that must have gone to this, um, especially by the, the, the sort of the, the legal teams, um, was really very impressive. The judgment has sort of still left open a certain areas of ambiguity. Some of those were um, certainly assisted in clarification at our consequentials meeting last week, albeit the final declarations um, are yet to be posted on the FCA's uh, website. But there still probably will remain a number of key issues and you know, whether or not um, either side would seek to appeal, um, we'll probably find out in the next, in the next few weeks. Uh, the, the issue of sort of the overturning of the principles of Orient Express, you know, that has got ramifications far beyond COVID-19 claims, especially in relation to uh, CAT claims. And it may well be that insurers, you know, who, who maybe were, were, were fond of that um, particular um, case law that may seek to appeal and, and, and uh, reinstate it. On the disease wordings, again, this was generally favourable to policyholders. Um, the area that may sort of get appealed is the is the sort of link between um, the requirement for uh, a case of COVID-19 within a certain area um, and whether or not that then should link into the causation, i.e. the loss should be the loss that flows from that particular um, outbreak rather than you know, the general impact of the national outbreak, which is what was held in the test case. 
In relation to the hybrid wordings, again, that restriction imposed, um, I think is potentially going to give rise to um, a, a challenge in relation to category five businesses. I think this was highlighted quite heavily in relation to uh, Hiscox. Um, you know, when the, when the test case verdict originally came out, uh, it was sort of held as, as, a, as a success for policyholders, but what was quite noticeable was Hiscox share price increased quite significantly and subsequently um, their reserves were, were dropped in part because two thirds of their policyholders um, are in sort of category five and it was deemed that there was no cover. Uh, now, it, the consequentials hearing last week, this was um, sort of heard further. Uh, there was a, a, a request by uh, Hiscox to put into the declarations that there was no cover for category three businesses that were allowed to stay open, but also category five. But this was uh, rejected and there is still a, a chink of hope in relation to category five relating to um, the regulations requiring people to stay at home um, if they could work from home. Um, however, the court still held that there would be sort of rare circumstances, albeit it didn't really give any further guidance on this. So it's still an area which has a little bit of ambiguity, but it may not be the case that those category five businesses simply have uh, no cover. Um, the prevention of access and denial of access Again, probably the link to the sort of mandatory closures and whether um, things like the regulations uh, around you know, um, not moving could, could trigger this. But I think where the, where the wordings require prevention or denial, um, you know, it does seem likely that that sort of mandated closure is going to be required. Um, and I think really the cover is going to come where the wording is a bit, a bit softer in relation to more sort of advice and hindrance of access. Okay, next slide. So, so just sort of in relation to the sort of next steps, um, when, when the judgment was, was issued on the 15th, uh, insurance had seven days um, to issue updates to the policy holders that were impacted by the test case. From what we've seen thus far, I think that's generally been a, a bit of a holding letter, um, in part just probably because of the complexity of the judgment and just trying to um, really get to grips with, with what it has meant and the fact that they were still required to sort of clarify some points that was that was heard um, last Friday. Uh, the FCA has issued a dear CEO letter um, encouraging insurers to, to seek to progress claims of the type that judgment says should be paid um, or at least progress them so that they are um, you know able to be paid uh, once the appeal has been heard and the judgment has been handed down. So there's certainly pressure from the FCA uh, for insurers to start to engage with policyholders where there may well be uh, cover. I think really what most people are waiting to see is um, you know, whether an appeal is going ahead and when that might be and obviously which points might be appealed. Um, it, it's, it's clear that there are ongoing discussions between the FCA and the insurers um, and I think this is sort of highlighted by the fact that uh, QIC sought to be um, joined to the action uh, last Friday uh, in, the, in, the, in, the op in the chance that RSA, who sort of who has the lead policy, which is similar to QIC's, may, may settle with the FCA and therefore not allow certain arguments to be appealed. Um, and unfortunately for QIC, they were, that, was, that um, request was rejected. So there is still the possibility that individual policies, um, some of the insurers who are sort of the lead for those policies, they may seek to uh, and agree an outcome and, and, and they won't be appealed. That being said, both the FCA and insurers have lodged um, leapfrog appeals to the Supreme Court. They have been um, accepted and we shall sort of still see um, the outcome of that. Um, I think there's no doubt that the, the the hearing on Friday was, was, was quite critical and the declarations that come out of that should take away certainly some of the ambiguity in relation to any areas um, of the judgment. But there's no doubt that it is uh, you know, a very, very complex judgment and um, what has to happen now obviously is, is to take these legal principles and apply it on a case by case basis, which will give rise to, uh, again, you know, further complexity. So I think we should get a, a better picture really all round in relation to the progression of the test case and then the appeal. Uh, we should get 
sort of certain certainty in relation to how the judgments um, being viewed uh, and take away some of that ambiguity. And I think the next task could well be uh, to start to quantify K claims, um, which in itself is, is going to be quite a, a significant undertaking from, from all sides. And I shall pass on, I believe, to uh, Santi. Thanks, Richard. So, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'll be talking about the impact that coronavirus has had on claims reserving, mainly from a trial perspective. So COVID-19 needs no introduction. Of course, we've all lived through it and have followed it quite closely in the press. Coming up to year end, there will be a need to talk about COVID's impact on insurers' results and balance sheets. More specifically, there will be the need to know the PL impacts and how it has been factored into the reserves carried forward. And forward-looking assessments in the financial statements will also be tinted by the profound impact that the pandemic has had on the global economy. When it comes down to reserves estimates, everyone will look at the actuaries inside the insurance companies. The basic tool actuaries use when coming up with their reserves estimates is to look at the past using clever statistics for hints about the future. But COVID-19, with COVID-19, there is really no directly comparable past experience. It is really truly one of those events not in data referred to in the Solvency II directive. And we can currently all agree how everything is so uncertain and that the reserves are gonna be very uncertain, but at the end of the year, we all have to put a number on them. We can't leave the answers blank. So now that we are past the first lockdown, some impacts of coronavirus on insurers have become clearer. So on the right side of this slide, I have put the, a few of the impacts that we have seen of COVID on some of our uh, insurance clients. And I will now go through these in a slightly different order to that that is shown in the slides. I will attempt in turn to go from those impacts that are quantifiable and very certain to those that are less quantifiable and more uncertain. So on the, on the very certain side, we, we can start with event cancellation costs. These are now almost known with certainty and the impact on the P&Ls is already past the rate, it's a fact. Next. Uh, so, and then we go on to uh, changes in um, exposure. No, previous slide, please. Changes in exposure uh, have resulted due to coronavirus. And many of these changes have had a positive impact and some have had a negative impact with varying degrees of uncertainty. For example, uh, most airplanes are now grounded rather than flying around. And it has naturally reduced the exposure to the usual aviation perils. But now, because these airplanes are standing somewhere, they're, they are exposed to new perils that before they were not, for example, natural catastrophes. Reduced global trade has also reduced the frequency of many claims that came about from the normal course of business. But um, some of these claims that have come about have had um, costs that are slightly higher than would have been expected. And this is because of the difficulties of rectifying matters in a socially distanced world. And we have seen this to be the case on, on the marine side quite significantly. Some exposures have actually increased a lot due to the coronavirus, such as companies' exposures to cyber risks as a consequence of people now working from home. Further, there is the anticipation that when factories restart, after being shut down for a while, that machinery breakdown claims can emerge at higher numbers than normally. But due to the short tail nature of most of these claims, we will know by the end of the year if this is the case. So on the grand scheme of things, when it comes to the end of the year, there will be some degree of certainty around all of these matters that I've just discussed. Now moving on to matters that are more difficult to quantify. So the FCA test case for business interruption has cleared some uncertainty on coverage, but there are many uncertainties still remaining. For instance, the remit of the ruling is only the UK 
many of our clients have international exposures too. There's potential for appeal and therefore uh, the, the, the ruling to change. The interpretation of the ruling is tricky, as Richard mentioned. Assessing damages is not straightforward and it will take a very long time to deal with so many clients. The ruling does not clear uncertainties related to reinsurance coverage. So the ultimate impact on insurer's balance sheet is still quite uncertain. The development patterns for these claims is unlikely to be similar to those business interruption claims of the past. So actuaries will need to really think about how they're going to project these claims to ultimate. Other impacts are even more uncertain. Socially distanced working conditions may lead to ineffective risk management at industrial sites. And these can lead to an increase of incidence of claim events. Lockdowns worldwide will have constrained the abilities of courts to process claims at the same speed as before, therefore delaying the claim life cycle of, of all claims currently being disputed. And as a consequence, a better than expected back year performance on standard actuarial methods may prove to be unreal when courts get back on track and clear any backlogs. The impact of the looming recession is yet to become clearer. And DNO may be particularly exposed as inadequate contingency planning may be blamed for some insolvencies. And last but not least, larger government spending and loose monetary policies at a time where economic output is constrained can put pressure on prices. And the effect of inflation and insurance reserves is something quite tricky to assess with any degree of certainty. A slide, please. So the clearly different context within which claims will have arisen during 2020 means there will be increased attention on the justification given for the crucial actuarial assumptions driving the research. Moving on from previous practice, the justification of the expert judgments from actuaries will not be so much grounded on statistical analysis of claim triangulations, because in this case, the past is no, not, not really a good guide to the future now. These justifications will need to be more grounded on an assessment of a wider range of data, but one that by necessity will have to be, will have to have emerged more recently. So for example, a plan loss ratio for the year 2020, which was drawn in late 2019, will clearly not serve as a valid assumption in the determination of the IBNR for the 2020 year of account. Some adjustments to that plan loss ratio will need to be done. Likewise, a claim pattern that reflects the emergence and development of claims over the past 10 years will very likely be inadequate to infer anything about claims emerging in 2020. Those setting reserves will then need to listen to claim teams and underwriters, perhaps more than they did in previous years. But in doing so, they will need to identify which of the statements made by the business is, are, which of the statements are substantiated by data and which are not, and just mere speculation then they will need to work out how to quantify the likely impact on expected ultimate and earned losses and focus on those that are most material. Each of those statements then would be need to put, be put in one of the quadrants here on the right side of the uh, slide. All in all, companies will need to perhaps do a little bit more analysis to justify their assumptions this year, identifying what is known and can be quantified from that which is not. And above all, they will certainly receive a bit more challenge this year than in previous years if they are arguing that coronavirus has implied a much better than expected performance and therefore a reduction in their reserves. Slide, please. The consequences of getting the 2020 reserves wrong will bite sometime next year or shortly after that. And time spent now analyzing the implications of COVID-19 on claims reserving and having these analyses challenged by the reserving committees, the risk, risk committees and boards 
will not only prepare you well for the conversations to be had at the end of the year with shareholders and auditors, but also it may also shed some light into the future operational environment and its claims implications. For instance, the pandemic, the pandemic has accelerated the use of automated claims handling mechanisms. And this presents quite a bit of challenge now to assess what the right IBNR would be to place when, this, uh, when these automated claims, claims handling mechanisms are being used. But this way of operating uh, will have become established in the future and per perhaps it will become established faster than many people would have liked. But we've been plunged into this new world because of the unusual circumstances of 2020. Also, remote working brings with it new challenges and risk factors for insureds as working from home will become more widely accepted. Looking into the future, the pandemic has also accelerated the re the rationalization of supply change, chains, with the return of manufacturing to some developed countries. Our, as manufacturing companies have realized that having a very spread out uh, supply chain where their markets are not, uh, the, where their markets are, uh, do not live, is a risk. And so this will naturally shift the risk profile of the risks these companies face and will ensure. And as a last thought, I'd like to leave you with uh, that as the world rethinks their way of working under this new reality, so too insurance companies will need to adapt and rethink the assumptions and methods used for claims reserving. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. I'll leave you now with Thomas Toe. Thank you, Santi. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you're all keeping well. Um, so two weeks ago, the Chancellor of the Exchequer made an announcement of how they'll rethink how they're going to support the jobs market in the UK. And they also announced that the autumn budget will be scrapped this year so they can focus on the coronavirus uh, measures. So this month, October, is the final month of the job retention scheme or the furlough scheme as it's uh, commonly known. And in this final month, um, the government will cover up to 60% of wages of furloughed employees, up to £1,875. And employers will need to cover 20% of wages, up to £625, uh, plus employers' national insurance and pension contributions. And they've confirmed that this is the last month, and that will be replaced by a job support scheme, which I'll talk about in a moment. But HMRC have been heavily targeting fraudulent and incorrect furlough claims of up to £3.5 billion. So I would suggest strongly to anybody who has made this claim to go back, revisit their calculations and make sure that is correct. Um, otherwise, you'll be facing penalties. I know HMRC have sent out many, many letters to lots of businesses who they um, suspect of making either fraudulent or incorrect furlough claims. So I said, please do review your uh, calculations. The job retention bonus, um, that's still there. Um, so companies will get a one-off payment of £1,000 for every furloughed employee that remains continuously employed up until the end of January 2021. And companies will get this regardless of whether they uh, move on to the job support scheme, which I will talk about on the next slide. So, new, so the new job support scheme, um, the new job support scheme, uh, this will operate for six months from the 1st of October. Uh, to the end of April 2021. It's available to SMEs and large companies that can prove that they are still suffering a significant drop in turnover as a consequence of coronavirus. So all employees on the payroll at the 23rd of September 2020 who work at least 30% of their normal contractual hours can qualify for the job support scheme. The government will cover 30% of the employee's usual wages um, up to just under £700 per month for the contractual hours not worked. So for example, if the employee just works a third of their time, then the government will cover one third of the two thirds of their wages um, for the time they're not being worked. So essentially 22%. And employers will be required to match this payment uh, in percentage terms, as well as pay employers national insurance contributions and pension contributions. So in my example of an employee uh, working for the minimum third, then employers will have to match the 22% uh, the government pays. 
So what this means actually for the employee, the job support scheme will guarantee employees a minimum income of 77% of their normal earnings, uh, with employees meeting at least 55% of the normal wage costs, plus of course the national insurance and pension contributions. Now, as you can see, when you compare the uh, furlough scheme to the job support scheme, you're paying 20% this month, and next month you'll be paying at least 55% of the workers' wages. And that's, that's a big jump. Uh, that's a big jump and a very big cash outflow. Um, so what we've seen is a lot of organisations um, on the next slide um, thinking, rethinking their remuneration strategy. So moving away from uh, a cash-based remuneration to share-based remuneration in order to conserve cash. So on this particular slide, there are just a few examples of what uh, we are helping firms to do. So employees are being invited to take salary reduction or deferment and being granted shares or options in their place. Um, all using deferred shares and options to defer tax charges and remuneration. Um, again, uh, with view to um, deferring payments of cash. And finally, uh, replacing new bonus plans with share incentives. Um, so as you can see, all these are very much aimed at uh, conserving cash. Um, on my next slide, IR35 off payroll workers, um, a very controversial piece of legislation. It's been um, in the public sector uh, since 2017. I wasn't meant to be with the private sector uh, from April this year, but of course um, COVID-19 hits and it's been uh, postponed, thankfully. Uh, until April uh, next year. Um, so these rules are, if you engage workers who are paid off payroll, so contractors by a personal service company, you will be responsible, so the company responsible for assessing if these off payroll worker rules pr apply for all contracts in force on or after 6th of April, 2021. And they're very complicated, um, lots of tests. So looking at uh, whether the contractors under the company's direction, uh, whether they um, are permitted to work for other parties, whether they wear the t-shirt, whether they use their um, facilities. So lots of considerations in there and not, uh, not easy, um, which is why this uh, bit of legislation is, is so controversial. Um, but this will become much more relevant, I think, as uh, COVID-19 moves on, um, particularly where a lot of firms are rethinking their hiring strategy, their resourcing strategy. So maybe there's a freeze on recruitment or maybe there's been some temporary um, or some staff layoffs. So as a consequence of this, uh, we are seeing uh, more organizations, um, insurance uh, companies, uh, looking to contractors to fill the uh, temporary needs of their organizations. And uh, from April 2021, um, hopefully things will be pick it will pick up then and um, coronavirus will be behind this because if you've seen the press um, Boris Johnson is saying that uh, we'll all be vaccinated by then at that point apparently um, who knows um, but uh, if, it, if, if it does pick up then maybe this won't be as much of an issue but uh, certainly um, as uh, firms uh, look, look more to contractors this is something that needs to be considered very carefully and um, you know the responsibility for paying PAYE and NICs uh, will, will fall on the shoulders of um, companies. So my next slide, talk about um, travel restrictions. So lots of travel restrictions in place at the moment, unfortunately, for those of us who are, um, well, were anyway, were thinking of uh, traveling overseas um, or um, going overseas for, tra for, for, for business purposes. Um, so with these travel restrictions in place, if, for example, uh, you have a board member of an overseas insurance company or a reinsurance company who is stranded in the UK as a consequence of the travel restrictions, and whilst in the UK they are attending board meetings, albeit virtually, so by video conference, um, and making those board decisions in the UK, that might have um, implications for the overseas company's corporate tax residents uh, because the UK uses a central management and control test, uh, which uh, essentially is at the highest level at, at board level. So where those board meetings take place and where those board decisions take place. So, um, so I said, if you've got someone stranded in the UK making those decisions, it might have implications for their corporate tax residents. Um, 
And similarly for permanent establishment, which looks at the operating um, level, if you've got an underwriter of an overseas company who's stranded in the UK, but, but continuing to work remotely and concluding uh, insurance contracts, uh, then again, um, for tax um, purposes, uh, that might create a taxable presence uh, in the UK. Um, so some, some quite serious um, implications there for overseas uh, corporations um, whose employees are stranded in the UK. Um, HMRC earlier this year did usefully uh, issue some guidance uh, saying that um, uh, saying that the legislation is flexible enough to deal with these situations. Hence, they've unusually not issued um, any concessions um, in respect to the travel restrictions. Uh, but they said it's, it's it's flexible enough for people to um, for people to uh, 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 determine their corporate tax residence and uh, permanent establishment. Um, and what they have said was um, they won't look at um, isolated incidents. They will look at the um, holistic, look at it holistically. Um, but as I said, it's something that is, uh, this is a very uh, complicated area. It's, uh, there's a lot of case law, UK case law involved in this. So it's very complicated. And, and I would strongly suggest that you know, if you do have um, employees or directors of overseas companies who are stranded in the UK, then very much uh, review that situation. Um, as a whole uh, throughout the year. And, and, and similarly, whilst I've just covered the UK, you know, if you've got UK directors and UK employees um, stranded overseas, then no doubt overseas um, countries will have their own uh, rules and regulations in respect of these um, particular issues uh, as well. So do, do look at that. Um, my final point is on VAT. Um, so as you all know, this is old news, but uh, payments on account of VAT due between 20th of March and the 30th of June, that's been deferred and is now uh, due by the 31st of March, 2021. Um, that, that, that's old news. But uh, two weeks ago, um, Sunak did announce that uh, now you'll have the additional option of spreading that particular payment uh, by an extra year up until the 31st of March, 2022, uh, interest-free. Um, so again, that's, that's good news um, for, for companies hoping again to, to conserve cash. So even if so even if you're able to pay it, but it's it's it might be a quite uh, good option for you to spread that payment and as I said conserve cash for budgeting purposes. Um, that concludes my slides, and I'll hand over to Alex now to take your questions. Thanks very much, Thomas. Um, we've got a few questions which have come come and 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 through. I'm I'm to, um, I'm booked, but I'm, I'm please do 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 um do um do um ask um, more questions as well. So this first one's for Force of Charles. Um, and it's really, could you expand your point um, about people traveling overseas and using Zoom and not being able, and, and um, not breaching regulatory rules? I think this is in, in a, in a um, um, this is really in relation to Brexit um, and, and where the business is being done. Uh, thank you, Alex, yes. You're correct. It is in relation to Brexit and where the business is being carried out. Um, I was just looking at what are the current risks um, out of the change of the business model. Um, the IDD covers using uh, websites um, to place business. So currently we're uh, a UK insurer could place um, use a website to take risks from abroad, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So a motor insurer could have a Latvian business using a website and, and be authorised to buy business in the UK. Not possible under Brexit if there is no um, passporting rights, so you couldn't use that website. So where we are in the new world, um, if we're doing a Zoom call, um, are we underwriting uh, a risk that is, is uh, an EU risk, which is no longer, we are no longer um, allowed to authorise or authorise to complete? And that's really what I was getting at. Partially, it'll be a lawyer's point at the end of the day, um, but it's me just thinking about the potential risks that are there. I hope that helps to answer the question. Thanks, Charles. Um, this one's for Thomas. Um, um, 
um, can employers reduce the 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 the, the um, sort of um, employee income? You, you, I'm sorry. Can employers reduce the um, income of of a, of a, of a, of um, of of um, of of uh, sorry of employees unilaterally, um, or does it require consent? Uh, this is uh, th thanks, Alex, and th thanks to, uh, for the person asking this. Um, this is a point of uh, employment law, so it's not a, not, not a tax question, but, um, but as far as I'm aware, it, 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 it's not a unilateral action, so be, be, be careful with that. There has to be uh, discussion with the um, employee and agreement. Um, so essentially, this is um, amending their employment um, contract. So uh, yes, please do tread carefully. Um, it does require discussion and consent of the employee and do work closely with your HR function. Thanks, Thomas. Um, there's a question as well about, about the um, test case as well. Um, so, Richard, if the FCA are encouraging insurers to, to, um, to um, um, meet claims post the court case, um, is it likely that insurers are going to await the outcome of the appeals? Um, and will this be viewed negatively by the FCA? Yeah, the FCA sort of covered this off um, sort of in their, in their DCEO letter. So obviously there is an outcome with certain claims um, that now are, are deemed to have cover uh, and there's sort of an expectation that they are progressed. But there was an acknowledgement um, of the appeal. And I think the wording they used in relation to that was progress the claim so that the claim would be in a position to be paid as soon as the appeal judgment had been handed down. So it, it maybe suggests that there's an expectation to at least progress the claims so that they can be, depending on the outcome of the appeal, paid straight away rather than waiting for the appeal and then starting the process. Um, and then I think it also depends on what grounds are being appealed. You know, if, if the appeal is the difference between cover and no cover, then, then, then it's sort of understandable. That, that maybe sort of no, no progression might be made, no payments may be made. But if it's the difference between one, one quantum or another, um, then maybe there's an expectation that you, know, you would progress on the, the sort of lower value and but quantify the, the higher value pending, pending the appeal. Fantastic. Um, and one final question. Um, do you, um, um, sorry, um, um, are, are there any Brexit related restrictions around working from from um, um, home um, 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 and and um, and um, and um, and um, and and um, 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 sort of um, sort of um, um, sort of um, in particular from those working overseas? I guess that's for me again, Alex. <laughs> um, so luckily, if you're working in your Spanish villa um, and I guess as long as you're writing, UK risks, um, that's fine because you're authorised to write those risks um, in the UK. If you're working from a Spanish villa and you're writing Spanish risks, then you need to be authorised in Spain to, to write those risks. So I hope that um, does it. And of course, Thomas um, yeah. has got the, the tax point as well, which you might want to just reinforce. No, thanks, thanks, Charles. Yeah, I was exactly going to say that. That um, further to my permanent establishment point, that you know, if you've got an underwriter sitting in Spain, writing business in UK business or in Spain, then I'm sure the Spanish authorities would like to get their share of tax on those activities that are taking place in Spain. So again, do tread very carefully uh, whenever you have this sort of situation. It is interesting because we've been and um, we've had 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 um, quite a few questions on this arising because of COVID where guys may want to work from overseas if they're yeah. um, from overseas or, or, or sort of may not want to, may want to lock down somewhere else. Um, but uh, um, there's also a COVID question around it as well, which has tax implications as well. Um, well, thanks, thanks for, 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 for the um, speak, 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 speakers. Um, I'm a, I'm a, and uh, and, um, and, um, and um, thanks for all, 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 all um, phoning in this morning.